Yeah, thank you. Hi there. Can everyone hear me? No. Can you hear me? So is it, should I project more? Or maybe I should lift up my mic? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Just so Hi. you can hear me. <laughs> you don't need to hear the guy in the middle. Just, um, do you want to test your mic? No? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone, and welcome to um, our panel today. I want to start by thanking all of the sponsors that you can see up behind us. And I also want to take a moment to remind you that there are more book festival meets science festival events. There, there are two talks today, one at three and another one at four. So we warmly welcome you to those talks as well. But for now, you are here. To, to learn how, uh, as all good people here, to avoid bad thinking. And so um, strap in, we're going to learn just how to do that. So we're here today to talk about Steve Nadler and Lawrence Shapiro's When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, How Philosophy Can Save Us from Ourselves. Um, Larry is um, to the far left of me, and he received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992. He has spent his entire career here at UW-Madison, where he is now the Berendt Ench Professor of Philosophy. He's published many, many, many books and articles on areas of philosophy, including philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology. Some of his works include The Miracle Myth, Why Belief in the Resurrection and the Supernatural is Unjustified of 2016. Um, his book, Embodied Cognition of 2011, won the American Philosophical Association's Joseph Gitler Award for an Outstanding Contribution in the Field of Philosophy of the Social Sciences in 2013. Larry's co-author, and colleague in the philosophy department here at UW-Madison is Steve, Stephen Nadler. Steve is a Vilas Research Professor and the William H. Hay II Professor of Philosophy, and he is also the Director of the Institute of the Research in the Humanities here at UW-Madison. In addition to writing When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, his most recent books include Manasseh ben Israel, Rabbi of Amsterdam, written and uh, published in 2018 as part of the Yale Jewish Lives series. And Think Least of Death, Spinoza on How to Live and How to Die, also from Princeton University Press 2020. Or well, not also, but from Princeton University Press. And he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for his book on Rembrandt's Jews, in addition to being a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So I wanna thank you all for coming and thank the two of you for being here today to talk about your book. Thanks. Thanks, thank Jennifer. Um, so Larry, let's start with you. I wondered if you could just open with a brief distillation of the book 
And tell us a little something about what drew you and Steve to write the book. I'll, I'll start with the second okay. question first and might motivate my answer to the first. Steve and I were troubled, probably like a lot of people in this room, about the sorts of uh, cataclysmic events we see, we see going on and around in the, in the, in the world, such as uh, resistance to efforts to prevent climate change, resistance to vaccines that would uh, prevent spread of COVID, uh, an insurrection that sought to overturn our, our democracy. And much of this, uh, many, many of these events are a consequence of people not thinking well, people being influenced by misinformation from Facebook, from other sort of social media outlets. And uh, as, as trained philosophers, we've been, um, we've been taught principles of good thinking. Uh, it, it, it's not that we're smarter than anyone or, or, or more capable of anyone, just as we've been trained and practiced these principles that have been around for thousands of years. And so our hope in this book is to convince people that there are good ways of thinking and uh, apply these sorts of principles when it comes to making decisions that could have tremendous impact on our future. Okay, wonderful. Steve, one of the, you have a lot of fabulous phrases in the book. <laughs> um, uh, and one of them that I think is particularly striking and I think many of you will find uh, troubling but also very useful is epistemic stubbornness. And I wonder if you can tell us what is epistemic stubbornness and why is it so pernicious? It's, um, well, we've been talking about bad thinking. I think another word for bad thinking that we use in the book is irrationality. And, you know, we have the COVID pandemic, but I think there's also a pandemic of irrationality. Mm -hmm. And epistemic stubbornness is at the heart of this irrationality. What it consists in is simply the refusal to tailor your beliefs to evidence. It's to come to believe things in the absence of any evidence that points in favor of the truth of those beliefs. But more seriously, it's the refusal to give up your beliefs, um, unfounded, unjustified beliefs in the face of evidence, clear evidence that the beliefs are false. Um, this is the, uh, the stubbornness behind conspiracy theories, such as the Democratic Party is enthralled to a cannibalistic uh, child sex ring running out of a pizza parlor in Brooklyn. I happen um, to believe that, by the way. Yes, yeah. so I had to really change your mind on that one. Um, epistemic stubbornness is like any kind of stubbornness. It's refusal to, it's, it's a stubborn uh, standing by beliefs in the face of counter evidence. And what's so troubling is that we see that these are not just problems of thinking, but problems of action, because it leads to people refusing to vaccinate against the, um, the COVID virus people taking charge on January 6th of what they perceive to be as a stolen election. Mm -hmm. And also there's a whole moral and ethical dimension to epistemic stubbornness besides just bad thinking. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the word stubbornness will make people think that it's will, that something here is willful. Is, do, do you mean, do you mean to, to say that there's something willful in that kind of, um, in that kind of thinking? Uh, one reason we chose the, the term stubbornness um, is because we didn't want to use the word stupidity. Is, no, well, there's there's a, a difference between being stubborn and being stupid, right? So there's no fix for stupid, uh, but stubbornness is the kind of thing that can be treated. Uh, we, we've, uh, or those of us who have had, had children have experience with stubbornness and uh, they're there are remedies you, you can offer to, um, to convince that stubborn child that what's in their best interest isn't what they currently want. And uh, if our hope is that by thinking about the methods philosophers have developed for thinking, people who stubbornly hold on to these, these aberrant views can be uh, convinced that they're wrong about them. I think it's a good question though whether it is or is not willful. I mean, there's a great deal of debate among philosophers and psychologists about how much control we have over 
are coming to believe things. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, you have a lot of control and you can't just come to believe something because you want to believe it. Mm -hmm. But in very, uh, in very many cases, there is an element of voluntariness in the things you believe. But there's a whole bunch of things that we find ourselves believing, not because we willed to believe them or want to believe them, but we just happen to have those beliefs. Mm -hmm. So even if the coming to have the beliefs is not a matter of willfulness, um, what, I think what we believe um, willfully is that um, whether you continue to hold those beliefs in the face of counter evidence, in the face of clear reasons for thinking that beliefs are false, there, there is an element of willfulness there. That's where the stubbornness comes in. Okay. It's always fun to teach a uh, intro to critical thinking class or an intro to philosophy class and uh, talk to students who are convinced that some argument they, they're relying on to draw some conclusion is, is correct. And then pointing out to this student where the logical error is or where the evidential error is. And you know, either it's because they want a good grade or because they actually believe us, they, they realize they've made a mistake. Uh, and if they persist in, in, in drawing this conclusion, this errant conclusion, well, that's, that's stubbornness. And at that point, it's, it's willful because they know better. All right, so you were careful then to help distinguish the ep epistemic stubbornness from let's say stupidity, which you said was perhaps another option. Yeah. What about, what about ignorance? Uh, ignorance is also a, 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 of course, a factor in, in bad thinking. Uh, it's, I think, harder and harder today to use ignorance as an excuse mm -hmm. for, for bad thinking. Uh, you know, it used to be, if I wanted to know who the, the 14th president was, I'd have to spend my Saturday morning in the library. Franklin Pierce. Or ask Steve. But, 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 but they now- They rehearsed this this morning, Dan. No, no, so I was, I was ignorant of who the 14th president was until Steve just told me, but um, now we just, we go to Google and we figure it out. And of course, go, going to Google can mislead you too, but um, it's pretty obvious, uh, or it could be pretty obvious, a little bit of effort, which sources are reliable and which, and which are not. And so, of course, we're all going to be ignorant of some things. Uh, we can't help that. But the kind of ignorance we see lying behind things like the belief that Donald Trump uh, the election was stolen from Donald Trump. That's, that's ignorance that can't be excused any longer. I, th I think there's ignorance and then there's ignorance and then there's ignorance. There's ignorance of things that you can't possibly be expected to know. Mm -hmm. Like how many moons are on that planet that we may have evidence for exist. Right? 16. 16. <laughs> the planet Franklin Pierce. Uh -huh. um, then, then there's ignorance where you really should have found out the information. You just didn't make the effort. Um, so maybe that's ignorance out of laziness or ignorance out of stubbornness because you're refusing to seek out the information that would lead you to improve your beliefs. But then there's ignorance where the evidence is right there in front of you. You really have no option but to have to deal with this in some way. And one way to deal with it is just by turning the other way. Mm -hmm. um, that that's willful. Well, I think both the latter two sorts of ignorance are willful, refusing to seek out the information that would make you a, a more responsible and rational believer. And then there's the the willful ignorance, where despite the evidence right in front of you, you refuse to modify your beliefs. Okay. So I I feel that I you know we're in Madison, and so we have a high demand, high flying, intellectually flying audience here, and I'm feeling the pressure from them for me to push on this this question. Um, so Larry, I know you weren't proposing that we outsource our thinking to Google or Steve, you're saying, you know, there's evidence and there's evidence, but isn't this, isn't that the issue? I mean, is, is the issue really that we have bad thinking or that we have problematic sources? Um, or let me put this a different way. If evidence-based thinking it is so important, um, is it a question of, of our evidence or is it a question of, of, of the sources that we have access to? In other words, I think most of us here in the room don't hold our beliefs based on direct evidence, you know, or even a careful parsing of all the, the evidentiary basis. We do it because 
um, of habit. We do it because of uh, family. We do it because of what, what, our, what newspapers we read, our Facebook feed. So given that so many of us do hold beliefs that are not based on, on direct evidence and, and so many of our sources are from elsewhere, what, what's the proposition here about what, what is it we need to do? So it's not just Googling, yeah? yeah? So I, th I think there's, there's, to draw another distinction, which is what philosophers annoyingly do <laughs> endlessly, um, there's the bad thinking, which has to deal with forming your beliefs in the absence or in the absence of evidence or in the basis of bad evidence. But then there's a kind of mad of bad thinking, mm -hmm. where your, your bad thinking consists in your refusal to assess and evaluate and discriminate among the sources of the information. So it's one thing to form your beliefs on bad information, but it's another thing to form your beliefs because you think that the source of that information is good when it's not. I mean, you, they're really uh, bad thinking consists in making no normative discrimination between the information that's coming out of you from social media, from Fox News, from the New York Times and from legitimate scholarly sources. If I can elaborate, um, outside of the beliefs I form on the basis of what I'm actually seeing in the world, I bet 90% of what I believe is, is based on testimony, like you were saying. And so of course, our beliefs about the world are, are very dependent on the sources, but they're, they're basic ideas that grew out of philosophy of science and, and studies of inductive reasoning that um, teach us how to avoid things like a confirmation bias, where a confirmation bias is the tendency people have to uh, look only for evidence that already confirms what they believe. Uh, and then there are things like uh, the technical term is base rate fallacy. What this involves is simply not thinking about how incredibly unlikely a given proposition is when you think about the amount of evidence required to confirm that. Mm -hmm. uh, and lessons like those, I think, can have great practical value. And when we're thinking about our sources that tell us that COVID was caused by 5G tower networks, we should ask ourselves about sort of how likely that is to begin with. And if we don't think it's very likely, then that means we need a whole lot of evidence in order to confirm that belief. Mm -hmm. And so I think just putting into sort of simple frameworks, these principles for good reasoning can be applied uh, regardless of the sources you're relying on. Okay. Is there, um, this may be too much to ask of your book, but is there a way in which um, we can use your book as a way to test the, evidence that were provided from uh, through, through our sources or test, test the, the rigor of our sources? You, you're not gonna find in our book uh, a sort of test that you can take to Fox News to find out whether what you're hearing from Tucker Carlson is true. Um, but, but what you will find, I, I hope, are uh, principles for how to think, as, as well as uh, defense of this idea of epistemic humility, this idea following from Socrates that it's really important to realize that most of us don't know as much as we think we know. Mm -hmm. And that'll take you a long way mm -hmm. to avoiding bad thinking. <laughs> um. I'm a big believer in yeah. epistemic humility, both the epistemological benefits and the ethical ones, but maybe we'll turn to those um, in a couple of minutes. Um, you refer to, in, in the book, about anti-vaxxers or, or the resistance or skepticism of, about of vaccines as an example of bad thinking, because there's overwhelming evidence of their efficacy and their safety, et cetera. And yet, if you bear down in particular communities, there might be different reasons why different communities hold, might hold that view. So for, um, think, for example, of African-Americans, which do tend to scale higher on skepticism about vaccines. Is that an example of bad thinking or is that an example of very good historical consciousness? I wouldn't see that as an example of bad thinking, as long as the if you have a position, if you take a stand on something, if you have beliefs, um, and there are reasons why you should or should not hold a belief, 
but they're countered by other legitimate reasons, that is reasons which legitimately, that is epistemically make you suspect the truth or the reliability of that belief. I think that's, that's what it is to be rational, mm -hmm. is to weigh countervailing reasons against each other. But in many cases, um, not the case of, of African-Americans who are distrustful given the history of the government's use of vaccines, but in many cases, um, there are reasons that explain why the person holds a belief. So let's take, for example, the belief in God. Um, we can give lots of reasons why somebody has come to have that belief. And these are reasons which causally explain why this person believes in God. They're not reasons which point to the truth of the belief. So if you believe in God because you find it comforting, because it gives you hope, uh, perhaps because people you respect believe in God, these are all reasons that explain why you have come to have that belief. Mm -hmm. But they're not reasons that indicate the truth of the belief. They don't give you reasons for believing it. They just give you reasons why you have come to believe it. Um, if those are the reasons, so, let, and so let's say you, you're being presented with this, um, the option of a vaccination and you're opposed to it with other reasons that make you suspect the truth of the belief, that's what rationality is. But if the reasons which are preventing you from holding this belief are not epistemic reasons, that if they have nothing to do with the truth or falsehood of the belief, mm -hmm. that's bad thinking. Okay. That's, that's very helpful. There, yeah, I don't have anything to add. To okay, that, sorry. With masks, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm relying on very few no, changes, I was whether, <laughs> whether he was just inhaling or <laughs> about to um, contribute something. Um, is it irresponsible for us to believe things for which we have inadequate evidence? And by that, I mean, you know, from an epistemological standpoint yeah. or even an ethical standpoint. <laughs> Um, part, part of what, what Steve just said is, is relevant to that issue. We, we, we use this term ought in various ways. So we can talk about whether you ought to believe something, even if you don't have enough evidence for it. And that sort of ought uh, is sometimes called the, the epistemic ought. It's an ought about concerning justification. Is there enough evidence such that this is really something you ought to believe? But then there is a different kind of ought, uh, sort of prudential ought, where uh, you can imagine that you've just been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and all the evidence suggests that you're, you're going to be dying in the next six months. You ought to believe you're dying, given all this evidence. But the prudential ought might say you ought not to believe it, because perhaps in not believing that you're going to die in six months, you actually have a frame of mind that increases your lifespan, or you enjoy those last six months a lot more than you would have living under the threat of imminent death. So your, your, your question, Jennifer, is it, is it always wrong to believe something without adequate evidence? It's always epistemically wrong. You should not believe something that doesn't have enough justification. But when we turn to this other context, this prudential context, it could be quite reasonable to believe things without adequate evidence, if it if it does something good for you, that's very that's great. That's very helpful. I actually want to make that pivot. I mean, I think we're now sort of making tipping on some of the ethical dimensions mm -hmm. of of the the book. But before we do, I have to just um, hold the space for a historical question, and that is um, the the well, it's not the subtitle, but. Um, on the cover, it says something is seriously wrong. <laughs> a number, an alarming number of citizens in America and around the world are embracing crazy, even dangerous ideas. And I don't think that the, so what the book wants or suggests, and as you mentioned yourself, Larry, what drew you to write the book is the sense that we are in a kind of crisis moment an epistemological crisis um, that has radiating effects. And for any of us who have been halfway awake for the last, oh, you know, five or so years, this might not come as a surprise that we're supposedly living in, or not supposedly living in an era of alternative facts, truthiness, post-truth, um, truth isn't truth, to quote Rudy Giuliani. What I want to ask you is a historical question then, and that is, is the is one of the arguments of the book or one of the premise of the book that we are in a uniquely epistemologically compromised moment or that our moment is some sort of historical aberration 
Um, or is that, uh, would you not go so far as to, to say that? I'd like to defer to my historian colleague. <laughs> it's not I, mean, deep, I have some views yeah, on it. I it's can... not deep history. I, I do think that uh, there's a continuum of bad thinking in human history. Um, you know, um, slightly more than 100 years ago, we were enslaving other people on the basis of skin color. Um, that's a prime example of bad thinking. So it's not as if all of a sudden there's bad thinking. It's maybe not even the case that all of a sudden there's a pandemic of bad thinking. But I do think that five years ago, we would not have even have thought of writing this book. Um, we wouldn't have been so afraid and so worried for uh, the state of American democracy mm -hmm. uh, and the fate of the planet, or well, the state of democracy everywhere. Um, and I think we have reached a kind of crisis moment, not because all of a sudden there's bad thinking, but because the means of the spread of this pandemic of bad thinking, the virus of bad thinking, um, has multiplied um, with the increase of social media, the decrease in attention spans, uh, the quickness with which people, especially politicians, are asked to respond, maybe not to issues, but to the believed demands of constituencies and so on. So I think the media environment in which we live um, and perhaps changes in education and the content and structure of education has made bad thinking probably a more a virulent and contagious um, disease than it would have been, you know, a, two or three generations ago. Mm -hmm. And I would say, as I'm um, actually the historian, I um, should uh, preface this to say that we could actually look at this larger historical moment and actually see also, though, in the books that are being written, yours is an example, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, and there's a lot of examples of this, that there's also a lot of concern about how we think, how we might think better, how we might think more, more responsibly. Um, so anyways, I think this, this, your book is part of a larger con conversation, which suggests this, at least the felt experience that, that um, we need to work hard to get our thinking right, um, yeah. to bring our world um, into social media has really been a, a game changer. Uh, and I think if we can distinguish threats to our way of living today from 100 years ago, 1000 years ago, it would be because of the influence of social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Tucker Carlson. <laughs> He's part of it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, the book, uh, I, I have to say, I absolutely love this, the title. <laughs> Um, and the book, the title also reminds me of a book with a similar title written in 1981, When Good Things Happen, oh, sorry, When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold Kushner. And um, as I'm sure you all know, that was a classic bestseller on how to, um, quote, offer clear thinking and consolation in times of sorrow. But it's a very different book. Yeah. <laughs> and I think your, yours um, uh, is, is pointing in a different direction. And yet, I'm curious about the word good in your title. So in Kushner's title, he's quite emphatic, you know, and, and I don't want to say sincere, but I mean, he's quite emphatic. Um, it's a book about why horrible things happen to people who are victims. They're blameless. Yeah. Is it the working of an inscrutable God? Is it the working of a, of, a, of a universe that's out of whack? He writes it in response to the loss of his son. So the, 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 there's, the, there's a lot freighted in that word good. I wonder if you're, you can say the same thing about the good people um, in, referred to in your title and discussed in your book. I, I think that's a really difficult question um, because there's always, uh, philosophers are always wondering what's the connection between being a good thinker and being a good person. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's somewhat plausible to say that if you are a good thinker, you won't be a bad person. Mm -hmm. That is, you'll know how to reason your way through difficult moral situations. You'll have a good grasp of moral principles. And when you put it all together, someone who's a good thinker uh, someone who Socrates way back when called uh, someone who's living an examine life, they'll not just be able to apply their moral principles to the things they do, but they'll be able to examine those moral principles themselves. And if good thinking goes that deeply, it's hard to imagine that you could be a good thinker 
um, reflect seriously on what you believe about good and bad and right and wrong, and yet still be a bad person. Mm -hmm. The more difficult question is, um, could you be a good person and engage in bad thinking? And I think we're, our assumption is, well, yes, of course, that bad thinking, while it's uh, it may be a, a flaw. I don't think it's a deep character flaw and that you could be a morally good person who just needs a right nudge, um, a right epistemic nudge to reflect not just on what you do, but on what you believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would add that um, no, it's, it's, too, it's too easy to, to look at, say, the, the insurrection and think that anyone who supports Trump has to be a white supremacist or, or a nut. You know, 70% or something of the Republican Party supports Trump. They can't all be bad people. Uh, I, I know conspiracy theorists. I'm related to conspiracy theorists. I don't, I don't regard my sister-in-law as a bad person. Uh, although, boy. <laughs> His wife is sitting right there. Out here. Yeah. Um, We're being recorded, Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's okay. Uh, she's she's in Greece. She'll never see this. But um, most people, I think, are just kind of accepting. They're they're they either don't want to engage in harder thinking than they need to. This was sort of the subject of of, of Kahneman's book, or they're very trusting of others, and and these are not traits that make someone bad, but it does make them bad thinkers. So I would say, I mean, Larry is, I think, in some cases, the more temperate member of the pair, although judging from what you see on his legs, obviously not always. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think I at least had to restrain myself as we were writing this book, not to engage in invective and insults. Mm -hmm. And I'm serious, the original title was gonna be On American Stupidity. But the publisher thought that's not really a good idea. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that in many cases, if they're not, if the people engaging in bad thinking are not bad people, I think they are in serious need of correction. Mm -hmm. I don't mean incarceration. I mean, um, you know, lessons in philosophy. But I think we had to moderate the tone of the book so as not to alienate the people who I think most, who we think need most to read it. Although, of course, the real question is, are the people who really need to read this book ever going to read it? And I see head shaking. And but at I, least people out there um, know people who need to read it, and they will read it and hopefully open up conversations with the people who they think need, um, need to be uh, enlightened as to the nature of their thinking. And, and although the book is free of invective, we can't say the same of the emails we've received about the book. Oh yeah, there's some good ones. <laughs> the, uh, the paperback edition will have some blurbs from some of the emails we get. Our favorite so far is one with the subject line that says, idiots, exclamation. <laughs> but they would need evidence for that. <laughs> yeah, they think right. they have the evidence. There won't be room in the blurb for the evidence though, um, but there is no evidence. I mean, they, they also complain about us being political hacks and in some, general sense it's a very political book but it's not a partisan book it is a book about the um the danger in our political system but we avoided taking any partisan i think we avoided taking any partisan stands we tried to be that's right you'd never guess whether we're republicans <laughs> or democrats so it's too hard to sit up here with two professors of philosophy and not ask you to share with us maybe just limit yourself to one each, one philosopher that you teach in your class to your students or that accompanies you on your runs when you're <laughs> and your jogs. Um, that's, that's part of your, um, part of your own internal dialogue, if you will, or, or conversation you recommend to your students. Who might that be right now for a moment, 2021? Uh, for us in the audience here. So for, for me, that would be uh, John Rawls, who is a political philosopher. And he wrote uh, just a magisterial work called Theory of Justice back in the 70s. And Rawls's concern was uh, how to correct for the sorts of vast inequalities in the distribution of wealth that we see in this country. And uh, an insight of lasting importance for me is, is this idea that um, 
it's, it's one thing to say that the wealthy have uh, earned their money and so deserve it. Uh, but then when you start thinking about how they earned that money, it turns out a lot of them are, are winners of, of lotteries of some kind. They were born to wealthy parents. They were born smart. They uh, had all sorts of opportunities just by luck. That is the real story behind their increase in wealth. And I, I think that insight is tremendously important. Yeah. So you asked for one, so I'm gonna give you two. <laughs> And then so, then you have to do three. I'm a Trinitarian. Okay. So uh, <laughs> without question, Socrates has to be at the top of the list. And I always begin my philosophy classes, uh, especially introductory classes with Socrates, because he thoroughly reinvented the notion of wisdom, uh, transforming it from a, a skill or lessons learned over a long period of time into something that uh, he called the examined life, where you reflect not so much on what's going on around you, but on yourself. Uh, the other one is Spinoza, who I'll just say got it all right. So there's <laughs> nothing more. To, I mean, Spin I think much of what we recognize today as modern, um, enlightened, secular, tolerant thinking has its origins in the 17th century with Spinoza. You're going to limit yourself to two. <laughs> oh, the third? Uh, Larry. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, we'll pivot now, or in a second to the audience, but now that Larry, he, I let him sneak in a second person, I want to ask you to sneak in perhaps another tradition. What do I mean by that? You wrote a book on Zen. Oh, and that, right, that was. <laughs> no, but my, the, the, my curiosity behind my question is, uh -huh. the, 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 this book is terrific for the kinds of things, the, these sorts of distillations of philosophers who we can bring into our conversation today and help us think about our thinking. Um, and, and yet there are authors, thinkers beyond that who I imagine have also informed your thinking. So I have in mind here, is there, I have in mind Zen, but perhaps it's something else. Uh -huh. Traditions, philosophies, ideas, well, not ideas, but yeah, thinkers that you don't cover in the book, but you actually think might be resources for us as we try to become better thinkers. I would, I would recommend um, a philosopher named Derek Parfit, who did a lot of important work on understanding what makes you, you, what makes you the person who you are. And uh, in thinking about answering that question, he turned to questions about um, how we should be living our lives today, given that um, the person we become in the future will be uh, sort of victim to the decisions we make today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that perspective, uh, Parfit's perspective on what an individual is, uh, is, is very, um, very similar to a Buddhist perspective. He's upfront about that. Let us turn now to the, we're the, we have a mic in the, in the center, so uh, we won't be passing around a mic. Unless someone's differently able, then needs us to do that, and then I turn on a mic. Okay, unless, sorry, unless someone is differently able and needs um, Laura to run the mic to you, but if you're able, um, come, come up to the mic, and if you want the mic to come to you, just give us a little sign. I don't think that, I don't think the mic is, the mic is not on. <laughs> So I have uh, two questions. One is, how would you just design a curriculum or a course at the really early stages, like for elementary school and then at high school level in critical thinking? I'd, I'd love to know, how, you know what the content of that would be for each of you. And then the other thing is, you know, we tend to think, especially a liberal room like this, that it's us and them, and it's so easy to separate the critical thinkers who are in rural communities, not who are not in rural communities, and, you know, us great liberals and all that stuff. And that's wrong. And, you know, and the one, one evidence for that is that even within families, there are sharp, sharp, sharp divisions. You, you mentioned that a moment ago. You know, my wife is very, very liberal. Her sister watches Fox News. And, you know, they're equally smart. They grew up in the same cultural environment. Do you have a, thoughts about why, why people come out 
that different, even in the same milieu? So the answer to your first question, it's a great one, uh, because we do think that education in good thinking, especially in philosophy, needn't be reserved for uh, higher education. There are philosophy courses taught in high schools, and there's no reason why it couldn't be done in elementary schools. Um, the rules of good reasoning um, are there from uh, an early age, and it's just a matter of showing, let's say, a five or six-year-old that, in fact, some of the most basic rules of logic are ones they use all the time when they decide whether to play with this friend or that friend, or whether to have a peanut butter sandwich or um, uh, a Lunchable, whatever it may be. Um, and then just moving on from there and showing them how deeply one can actually start to ask these questions. And children are already asking these, as we all know from having, if you have kids, there's always that next question, why, why, why? Well, that's philosophy. That's why we're so annoying because we're always asking why we're not taking anything for granted and either is the five-year-old. And it's just a matter of kind of formalizing their natural tendency to be inquisitive and channeling it in the right ways. I think it can be easily done if we had the wherewithal. And um, it's worth noting that it is being done. There, there, at West High, there's a, a, a teacher who's been teaching philosophy for, for, for years and years. And there are um, now uh, curricula for much younger children in, involving philosophy. I'd start by teaching them things called informal fallacies, uh, which are uh, tempting but uh, invalid forms of, of reasoning, and these are these are easy to learn. As as to the the, the second question, you know, why why is your wife one way and her her sister the other? Which is exactly the question I ask all the time, um, except about my wife. I don't know your wife, um, but uh, that's really a, a question for a psychologist. Uh, and there are social psychologists trying to figure out why it is. Um, people with similar backgrounds and sharing half their genes end up so different. Uh, um, so I, yeah, I wish I had the answer to that question. All of this does come with a, a warning though. Um, never ever at dinner time point out another person's fallacious reasoning. <laughs> it just kills the vibe at dinner. Are you gonna write a version of your book for kids? That's not a bad idea. Yeah. We can do a, Steve's son is an illustrator and he could uh, actually. Yeah, a graphic novel and bad thinking. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, here. Um, first, the fact question. What was the philosopher that you were alluding to? I didn't quite catch. John, John Rawls, R-A-W-L-S. And, and then the, the, the other was Derek Parfit, P-A-R, Parfit. P-A-R-F-I-T. Okay, I was totally off from what I thought I heard. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate the, the aspirational vision that seems to be undergirding your book and the vision. People need to read this and learn how to think well. Um, the, the image that comes to mind is in terms of the, the challenge we're confronting as a society is captured from the Marvel Universe. Hulk not like, Hulk break. How have you considered, how can, I mean, that may be hyperbolic, but there is a sense in which there is a, an id roaming the land uh -huh. that isn't going to read a philosophy tech book and go, yes, I should think this through better. It's like, <laughs> that's, that's so, right. Maybe I'm asking for a new here, book, but here, any here's, thoughts, here, any, yeah. any reflections? No, I, I've thought about that question a lot uh, because you know, Steve says we have our, our target audience, then we have the people like you who will read the book. Um, and so <laughs> here's, here's an analogy. I don't know how good it is. But in, in 1975, I guess, a philosopher named Peter Singer wrote a book called Animal Liberation. And this is a book that uh, was making a very strong case for vegetarianism. And it's considered as sort of the, the, uh, the fundamental Bible of vegetarians that started the movement. I have not read the book. Perhaps no one in this room has read the book, but we go to restaurants today and we always see vegetarian options. Now we're seeing vegan options. I think that goes a little far, but vegetarian options. And so none of us have read Peter Singer's book or very few of us have had, but the ideas permeated anyway, because some people read it and started talking about it. 
And people who had never read the book, never heard of the book, are now living a life that's very much influenced by the existence of that book. Now, I have, I have no aspirations that our book is, is going to have anywhere the impact that Peter Singer's did, but that's the kind of trend that books and others like ours, I would hope to, to initiate. I suppose if social media is not a total wasteland, that it can help spread not just dangerous ideas, but good ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Boy, I sound like a Luddite, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's not a line. I'll throw up just something else, just for uh, a way I've sometimes framed uh, things that things are rationally, often rationally explicable. You can explain or understand how certain like beliefs come to be held without those beliefs being rational. And is there some way that that can be used to, 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 to counteract the problem that you've identified? You know, the, uh, the heuristics that were alluded to Kahneman is like, he argues uh, to, to some extent that they are rationally explicable. It totally makes sense that people use shortcuts because it takes time and energy to go through the thoughtful ruminations and reflections. You know, we take our cues. You know, our beliefs are socially constructed and defined and internalized. So how do we push beyond that? Uh, anyways, yeah, thoughts. Uh, so, so one place to begin is, I think you mentioned uh, Kahneman, who is a uh, novelist uh, in economics and also uh, a wonderful psychologist. He, well, he's, he's, he still is, he's not dead yet. Um, his, his partner Tversky is, but um, Kahneman uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out why people make the mistakes that they do in order to try to figure out how they can prevent themselves from making these mistakes. And uh, he spends a lot of time training people who can then train people to avoid these errors. And um, I think that's the way that we should go. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask a bunch of questions, but probably one-on-one uh, -on -one if you stick around. But one related to the talk is you talked about good people and good thinking and how good thinking would hopefully lead to good moral decisions, I believe you said. And, um, you know, I think that there's, um, there's people who end up making tomorrow decisions or uh, group thinking or, uh, you know, desire to be um, part of the group and not be rejected. So, um, you know, could you elaborate on that a bit and sure. maybe the counter thinking to you need to have good thinking to be a good person? So it's not enough simply to do the right thing. Um, very often we do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, it's, you want at least it's a good idea to discriminate or distinguish between whether the action is right or wrong and why the person has done the action. That is, what's their motivation or what are their intentions? And um, somebody who does the right thing because it makes them popular, well, bravo for doing the right thing, but I think it's important to become a good person, to have that right action um, come naturally from having developed the right kind of character where you are an autonomous, um, self-determining moral agent who does what they do because they know it's right and good, not for what they have to gain from it or what other people may think of them. Um, and that I think, going back to the earlier question about um, early education, that's the kind of training that we also need to instill in, in um, our children, um, not just how to think well, um, not, just, and not just how to get along with others, because that often make, involves making moral compromises, but how to be a good person and what, what's required, how to think through the choices you make. And it has to come from who you are and not just what you do. Does that answer your question? I don't know if this is part of it, but what occurred to me is you can spend a lot of time thinking about things, 
but what propels a person to action mm. is a whole nother level. I mean, some people pay attention to political stuff and not just casually, but you, I'm thinking of those people who believed in the pedophile, pedophile ring in the pizza joint and stuff like that. Here they've painted themselves as heroes and actually doing a fabulously good deed. And yet it was premised in wrong thinking and everything else. Do you have any thoughts on what actually causes beyond thinking to action and so, bad action at that? So I, you know, in a way our book is only part of the story. I think psychologists have a lot to tell us about why people do the things we do. I mean, we blame a lot of the, um, the actions that people do and the bad thing that goes on in philosophical terms. But so for one of the topics we take up is why do people sometimes act contrary to their better judgment? You know that something, if any of you are smokers, you know that smoking is wrong for you, but nonetheless, you do it anyway. So people often act contrary to their better judgment. Um, it's a kind of moral weakness. Um, philosophers have one approach to that, but I'm sure psychologists have many, uh, uh, many different answers as to why people engaged. So I think you have to supplement the philosophical lessons that we offer here with what psychologists have to tell us about why people do what they do. Unfortunately, um, often what it takes to propel people to action is things get really, really bad. So, you know, today there might be a lot of people, not a lot of people who are resisting, say, uh, marching or acting uh, on behalf of a, a woman's right to choose. But if you know, if the whole country goes the way Texas goes, then maybe we'll see a lot more uh, action. So I think we all have our individual thresholds for when we decide we've, we've had enough. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, th this is like Steve was saying, a, a question for a psychologist, how we uh, recalibrate these thresholds, perhaps in the way that we should. Hello, uh, I missed most of your talk, but I think the big thing is, so you're talking about morals and I think the problem with society today is we see a lot of morals of the fact is, is absolute and there's relativism, relative morals. And I think, do you think that the fact that we can't determine which, like a lot of people, if you ask them, are their morals relative or absolute? And a lot of people will say relative, but then it can't really be, in my opinion, a moral because you can't just switch and change to benefit the person. But it seems like, especially with a utilitarian um, mind or viewpoint, that's exactly where we're going. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So th there's nothing worse than that first moment in a philosophy class where you're talking about ethics and the students say, well, who's to say what's right or wrong? <laughs> and I say, I say to them, well, you know, you can hold that position at the end of the semester after you've looked at all different ways in which philosophers approach ethics, but you can't start out that way. If you want to conclude it in the end, there are no absolute moral values. You'll have to have good reasons for that position. Uh, I actually tend to think that in many important instances, that's false, that there are absolute uh, right and wrongs. Um, but again, that's a position that has to be argued for. You can't just assume it. We're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So you and then one person in the audience who um, asked for the mic. Hi. Um, so I guess something that kind of kept coming up as a question for me, this might not be fully formed, but um, hopefully I get there by explaining when I thought of it is like the role of fear or kind of emotions in things when you want people to think clearly, um, you know, you want people to take action or you talked about um, power in a crisis period for different reasons, but, um, and I am by no means a psychologist or behavioral scientist or anything, but it's kind of a hobby read for me. I read a lot of books. And it seems like, um, you know, those like in a crisis, people aren't able to think clearly, even if they are a rational person or have good intentions or have done a lot of research, things come up where it's like, oh, I don't wanna upset my family or you know, there's this pandemic or I'm worried about my livelihood or the health and safety of people I love. Um, I was wondering if you could just, I don't know, had any thoughts on the role that that would play or how you, know, you want a certain target audience to read this, but um, at the same time, it, I guess, you know, seems like it could be hard for some people or they would be defensive or combative in wanting to read it like the idiots, you know, yeah. email or whatever, um, acting kind of out of fear. And it just seems like it could be hard to be rational when you are, you know. Well, well there, there's, there, there's fear in the moment. 
you know, the, the ship is going down, what, you sh what should you do? And then there's the, the sort of the worst kind of fear, the, the, the nagging uh, sense of doom that we have when we see glaciers falling into the sea and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, in, in the first kind of case, fear in the moment, um, I don't think uh, anyone should be held responsible for bad thinking. We're just good thinking is, is hard. It takes practice, it takes time. Uh, but, but the other sort of fear, I, I, I think it's, it's a fear that we have to acknowledge uh, and then ask ourselves how, how best to alleviate it and uh, give ourselves the time to come up with the right solutions. Last, last question. Sorry, um, I've found a lot of, we have family members who are Trump supporters. I have friends who are Trump supporters. I've asked them and they were Democrats to be young with some of them. And it comes to me that they aren't really thinking, they're reacting to one thing that happened to them. Uh, one is a stepdaughter said, well, I've always paid for my own insurance. I don't wanna support anybody's insurance. She doesn't want universal because she's paid for it all her life. And I said, you can't reason. She doesn't understand what the difference is. Um, but I think most people aren't thinking. I don't think they can think. They don't realize if A happens and then I do B, C is going to follow. They cannot do that logistic, logistical thinking. They just aren't capable. I mean, it's not just Americans who are have stupidity. I mean, most people are average intelligence or lower. And they don't have the ability to really think. They react or uh, it's not what I think of as thinking where I can't turn my head off. Uh, but that's been my experience. And I asked them, well, why do you feel this way? One friend of mine is very socially liberal. And so I said, why do you support Trump? We have money. That was all that mattered. And to me, that's the least important thing. So actually the way you frame that is, is perfect. Our, our book is premised on a slightly more optimistic view of human nature and the capacity for reason. But you asked the question, why do you feel that? That's a great question, but here's a better one, uh, which I always use when I come upon people who are spewing irrational beliefs. Why do you believe that? In other words, force them to come up with the evidence or reasons behind their thinking. And if yeah. they can do that, they, they could be hopeless anyway. But yeah. then you, you ask, well, then hopefully that their inability to answer that question reveals to them the unjustified nature of their beliefs. Another question I find valuable when um, having discussions with people is, what sort of evidence or reason would convince you that you're wrong? And if there's nothing, then you know right away that there's no point to the conversation. But if they say this, this, and this, and then you can say, and here's what would convince me that I'm wrong. Uh, now let's talk about the, these propositions that would convince each of us that we're wrong and, and try to determine which of those were the, the, the correct ones. Let me wrap up, if I may, just touching on um, your question and actually the question um, the woman prior to you and actually laced through some of them is it the distinction between thinking and reacting or thinking we're thinking when we're in fact doing something else. And I'm reminded, I'm going to paraphrase it of uh, William James. I believe it's William James's, well, it is William James, but the quote is something like, we often think we're thinking when we're just rearranging our prejudices, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so with that, I want to thank you too, because this book, is not about rearranging prejudices. Yeah, it's it's really, um, it comes at, at a moment when we have this language of an attention economy and we're all so keenly aware of all the things that are pulling at our attention and causing that reactivity. But what the book I think invites us to do is engage in fact in that practice of philosophy, uh, which is to think and not just react, not just rearrange prejudices. So I warmly welcome this book to you all. I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for the wonderful thank touch. You. And they're signing. They will be signing. So if anyone wants Wait, pardon. Books are for sale outside, and they're going to sign books. Thank you. I, thank you, Laura. Books are for sale. And uh, Larry and Steve will be signing the books um, outside. Thank you so much.